This Cape York Peninsula is a magnificent wilderness area, and as you can see, most of it is still in a pristine state. Along the shores here of the Gulf of Carpentaria is an unspoiled, wild, remote area, and it's just teeming with wildlife. Maybe uh, we can't compare it to the plains of Africa, because the animals are so different. But this is the only part of Australia, when you walk the land, it's like stepping back in time before when the white man came. It's also the only place where some Aboriginal groups have chosen to go back to the old ways of life, and they've succeeded again in living off the land with all its bountiful wildlife. The untamed gulf here is a prolific provider, a timeless land of plenty. Where the waters of the Gulf of Carpentaria lap the western side of Cape York Peninsula, the low land rises only a few meters above sea level. In the wet season, the river systems become vast lakes. Now in the dry season, the teeming life of the Gulf congregate close by the remaining waterholes and along the riverbanks. Here is an unspoilt wilderness and Australia's greatest wildlife refuge. In Beaver, Ben Crop has left the clear waters of the Barrier Reef behind him and is now travelling west through the Torres Strait. Ben and his wife Lynn are on an adventurous journey. They plan to penetrate deep into the Gulf and explore its vast rivers and teeming wildlife. The Strait has a colourful past and today we can still see the old luggers and native divers gathering pearl shell. Crab Island is the gateway to the Gulf. Its treacherous sandbanks extend far out to sea. Ben navigated Beaver through a narrow passage and emerged into a timeless zone. Inaccessible shores and shallow river entrances have protected much of the Gulf from exploitation. The many sharks, crocodiles and box jellyfish proved a lesser concern for Ben's team than the crossing of sandbars into river mouths to reach a safe anchorage. Touching. 
While Lynn calls the depth, Ben tries to judge where the narrow channel must lie in the muddy water. The hazardous crossing is made on a rising tide so that Ben can pull Beaver free if she does go aground. The first landfall in the recorded discovery of Australia occurred at the mouth of this river, the Penny Father. In 1606, the Dutch explorer, William Jans, sailed the Doofkin along the Gulf Coast. Jans lost one of his men in a skirmish with the Aborigines in what would be the first tiny battle for Australia. The team planned to live off the land while exploring the Gulf. Catching succulent mud crab is their first thought. He's gone under the dinghy. The pristine river is a fisherman's paradise. Rick Burnup is battling a healthy He's queen fish. He's off and running. Here he is. Oh, mine's just a baby. I'll get him in. Mine's definitely not a baby. Lynn's locked into a big trevally. They're hard fighters on light tackle, but not the best fish to eat. Oh, he's a good one. He's fighting well, even though he's very hard. Right. Got him? Yeah. Right up. I'll bring him in. He's a good size. Ooh. Oh, my oh, ache. Geez, he's a good size. <laughs> Okay. You ready? When the fish are biting fast, Lynn can afford to be choosy. Next on the line won't be thrown back, for it's the Gulf delicacy, the famous barramundi. Oh, he's nice. Good size. Whoa, jump. Good one. Oh, give me a few pounds. The Penny Father proves to be a bountiful provider, and there's still the crab dillies to pick up. Oh, yeah, he's pretty. Yeah. How do you tip him in? Just tip him straight over. Oh, yeah. Oh. Pull him, pull him hard. Ah. Oh! One fella crab! <laughs> oh, he's a fighter. Can you get his back legs? Um, I thought I... Ah! These things are worse than trying to catch them out in the open. In unspoiled areas such as this, the occasional visitor makes very little impact on the resident population. Even the larger fish are able to keep on growing to enormous size. It's incredible to see two huge groper immediately arrive, unafraid, for their share of the catch. A hammerhead has taken the shark line and wrapped it round and round the anchor chain. Oh, he's only caught by a little bit in, in his lip. Oh, yeah, it's it impossible like to untangle, so Rick winches up the shark to use its own weight to break it free. The hook's pulling out. Oh, he'll be fine. He'll live all right. Bigger and more dangerous marine creatures confront the team. Coming up next on Ben Crop's Untamed Gulf. White blossoms explode off the mangrove trees as a thousand cockatoos take to the air. The long-legged jabiru is the tallest of swamp birds and a graceful low-level flyer. A lone dingo scavenging along the beach draws the team's attention to an object which has drifted all the way from New Guinea. Have a go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use a paddle out of the uh, okay. thingy. I'll pull it out. Right. 
right, Fred. Well, she doesn't sink. Leaks a little bit. Does it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> William Jans first noted the red cliffs of Weeper. Not until 1955 were they recognized as the largest deposit of bauxite in the world. 3,000 people poured in. They came for the high wages. The tough and the feminine jostled to drive 75-ton dump trucks. <laughs> the gulf tranquility shatters with the roar of heavy industry. The land subsides six meters from the strip mining. Kamalco is rehabilitating the mining area with a forest of mahogany trees. The Gulf has been Australia's most productive prawning ground. The Aquarius nets spill a rich harvest onto the sorting trays. Ricky Hale's crew pick out a mixed catch of banana, king, tiger and endeavour prawns. Ricky catches up to 500 kilos a night, but the golf prawning industry is now on a rapid decline. At Cape Kuia, the Kirk River emerges from a large lagoon. It's a haven for wildlife. Lynn's approach has disturbed a large colony of spectacled flying foxes. These giant fruit bats hang in the trees in the daytime, their bodies wrapped in black leathery wings as they sleep. Just after sunset, the sky will fill with ghostly shadows as these nocturnal creatures fly to their feeding grounds. Lynn and Rick are searching for crocodiles. Extensive shooting almost reduced them to extinction. Protected in 1974, the saltwater crocodile has made a rapid comeback. A new generation has matured with little fear of man or boats. These are big crocs, four meters long. Crocodiles are potentially very dangerous creatures. A five meter monster stalked and ate a man near Weeper in 1975. The crocodile was shot and the man's body recovered, chopped into eight pieces. With these horrible thoughts in mind, the team's approach is very cautious. In tune with nature, a hunt with ancient spear is next on the untamed gulf. At the mouth of the Kendall River, an Aboriginal community established an outstation in 1976. They've returned to their traditional tribal land after years at Arakoon Mission. 
and proved it's possible to return to the old ways of life. This community has suffered many setbacks. A succession of three cyclones destroyed their original camp and much of the wildlife and vegetation. A huge tidal surge rose to the tops of these mangrove trees. Sela Kunata is making a new spear. The multi-prongs are ideal for catching both wallaby and fish. He applies a special glue drawn from the sap of a tree. It will bind the head to the long shaft. In the ways of his forefather, Sailor completes his craft work, smoothing the binding, using his own sweat on a piece of flat wood. You're making a new spear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I have a look at it? Oh, that's pretty good, eh? Are they very hard to, hard to throw, these? Easy for Easy for you. Yeah. <laughs> you think you could show me how to do it? Yeah, mate. <laughs> yeah? Oh, that'll be good. I'd like to learn. What do you just put this in the end there? Yeah, that's right. Really tight. Hold your warm oh, really tight. Pull it really tight, eh? Yeah, that's right. Two fingers? That's it. You got it. And what do I throw it? Hold your warm one. Hold the warm one. Yeah. <laughs> oh! Good one? <laughs> Never broke. I think I might need a lesson or two. Yeah. <laughs> you show me how to do it. Right. <laughs> Sailor and brother Percy are on a wallaby hunt. They search the burnt off land where new grass is sprouting. It's the wallaby's choice diet. hunt for their food. The cyclone devastation has pushed the wallabies further inland. They try to attract them back by burning the old grass so new green shoots will grow. To successfully live off the land, the diet must vary. The abundant lily stems are nourishing a kind of celery salad to go with the meat. The singed and gutted wallaby is placed on hot stones in a fire pit. Paper bark and sand will seal this simple bush oven. The ground oven is highly effective. In two hours, the wallaby is cooked to perfection. The tribal diet varies according to the whim of the hunter. Stalking wallaby one day, spearing fish on a sandbank the next. In the Kendall River, Catfish are abundant, and mud crabs are simply everywhere. The hunt for food is never ending, but it's always a lot of fun. Here's one, Rick. Oh, 
he's burying himself. Oh, there he is. Pick him up. Oh, got him. I think. Oh. Ah. Ah. Oh. You got him? Oh, he's sharp. <sighs> yeah, but I think I'm stuck. <laughs> Which way's up? <gasps> <laughs> oh, gee, just look at my. Oh. <laughs> I might need help I'm with him. from the front. You get him from the back. Oh, oh okay. right. So, let's That's get another good one, guys. A firm hold is necessary right up to the pot, but they're worth the struggle. Here we are. Well, that looks mm. good, isn't it? Good Cheers. drink, Dean. Cheers. 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 Sailor becomes a blood brother to a crocodile. Coming up next on the Untamed Gulf. Beneath the Kendall River waters, Ben witnesses a brutal battle. Claw is lost, snapped off at an inbuilt fracture line to break the hold. The dismembered loser crawls into a safe hole. Membranes quickly seal off blood at the site of the amputation. In one of nature's incredible mysteries, a slow molting process takes place. The crab emerges from his old shell with new limbs and a new lease on life. He will stay in the hole until the new shell hardens and nourish his body by eating his own discarded shell. The ebbing tide exposes the mangrove floor. A new cycle of activity begins for other strange creatures that now emerge for Ben to film in the muddy swamp. Two male fiddler crabs are locked into a ritualized fight. The oversized claw is a proud symbol, for the fiddler talks in a language of waves and gestures. The fish that walks on land, the mud skipper, joins Ben in the mud. Just before the rising tide reaches them, each fiddler cuts out a neat disc of mud. He flips it snugly into place over his hole now secure from predators until the next low tide in the mangrove swamp. A lone mangrove bends to the constant pressures of the elements. But inside the swamp lies a secure nursery for abundant marine life.
The epaulette is a small and colorful shark, easy to catch and totally harmless. The bountiful gulf waters rely on the extensive mangrove swamps. They provide essential food and shelter in the juvenile stage of every marine creature along the gulf coast. A rich harvest of prawns is dependent on the rivers and swamps. The swarms of pilchards and pop-eyed mullet are linked in the food chain to the birds above. It's a joy to teach about and to share in this wonderful legacy nature has given us. Dave Ward is a barramundi fisherman. He's one of the few who are aware of the importance of the Gulf's wildlife and the need to conserve it. Dave and his wife Beth live in the Kendall. It's an isolated life for his family, but the friendly creatures which gather around his home seem to make it not so lonely. Jenny Lott operated her own trawler in the Gulf. Then she turned to barrow fishing, and Lynn found her working alone in secluded Topsy Creek. <laughs> You've been here for a good number of years now in the Gulf, first uh, trawling and now barrow fishing. What sort of changes have you seen, the fishing and the wildlife? Well. Up these rivers you would never see anybody for six weeks or whatever length of trip you're out. But um, now, if you don't see anybody, it's very unusual. A lot more boats, a lot more people, people coming up to camp for their holidays. How do you like living here on your own? It's, it's pretty remote, even though you see a few people, it's lonely, no? Well, I'm not completely alone. I've got an ageship <laughs> here. And... Uh, I enjoy people's company, but it's very, very hard to live in a confined space with someone for up to six weeks on a boat, unless you get along very well. Have you seen any change in the wildlife as more and more people come into the area? Quite definitely. It's always when people move in, animals move out. A lot of them have guns, and of course they become gun shy. And in the early days, they wouldn't even move. All the pretty little wallabies sitting on the bank there just watching you. You could be about 10 foot off one, but now they're much shyer. They bound off as soon as they hear a dinghy. The Kendall Aborigines prepare for an important ceremony. Sailor is to be initiated as a blood brother to a crocodile. In dream time, there lived a powerful and aggressive freshwater crocodile called Kenna. He was in the form of a man. The subjugated natives introduced a saltwater crocodile called Pico, also in the form of a man, to challenge Kenna. But the evil Kenna speared Pico in the ribs. The Aborigines carried the wounded man down to the river, chanting this song. When they placed the wounded man in the water, he turned into a crocodile and swam away. Today the Kendall people reenact the legend and the lizard represents the crocodile. Sailor is chosen because he is the next leader of the clan. Only the boss man is initiated. It's a once in a lifetime happening. 
sailor's blood is drunk by the lizard. The lizard is then thrown into the sea. The Aborigines believe they have the power to turn the lizard into a crocodile, a blood brother to sailor. The Kendall River Aborigines believe this crocodile will not harm its blood brother and will in fact protect sailor from other crocodiles. There's no record of the local tribe ever being harmed by a crocodile. And yet we see just how aggressive a crocodile can be coming up next on Ben Crop's Untamed Gulf. The Edward River Crocodile Farm is operated by Applied Ecology and sponsored by the Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs. Many hundreds of crocodiles have already been bred under natural conditions to a commercial size for the skins. It's now the month of November, the mating season. But it's no easy task to bring the segregated sexes together to ensure a good breeding program. The bag over the eyes is vital. When the croc can't see, it becomes confused and unable to attack its tormentors. The catcher bravely wades in with bare feet. The female is very reluctant to be part of the operation. <laughs> the Aborigines of Edward River will benefit from a lucrative industry if a government decision is made to market the skins. If not, then their dispersal in the sea will ensure the survival of the crocodile population. This will be a difficult decision to make, for a conflict does exist between man and the crocodile, between public safety and the croc's right to live. In the Nassau River, the catfish are so thick, they feed like piranha on a fish carcass. Ben found four barra camps in this large river. Arthur Pratt operates from a land base with a refrigerated truck. He finds his own road in with a compass to guide him. It's nice to meet the friendly life in the Nassau, but living here is not all that pleasant. A swim is like having a mud bath. The water's so dirty. But who wants to swim with all those chomping catfish? Here the barra run big, and the catfish multiply on the abundant scraps. Lynn and Rick wait for this big carcass to test the number of frenzied feeders down below. Come on, catfish. They're nibbling. They're coming. The beaches are a Fossica's dream, the sea unveiling her many secrets. Look at the shells here, isn't it, Dean? There's one. Look. Yeah. That's a good one. 
Must be in here somewhere. You've got to look for some crabs, though, Link. Here's one. See this? That's a crab. Yeah. Eh? Oh, that'd be careful. Fossil crab. You know, but, you know Bruce uh, had uh, one of these carbon dated and 60 million years old. It's just, incredible, isn't yeah. it? And, and they, they apparently just uh, come up in this, uh, this area alone. Yeah, They're hard to that? see. Oh, that's a big crab, isn't it? <laughs> that one's a bit new, though. Yeah, I think we'd better bury that and come back a few million years for that one. Here's one. See, that's the same shape yeah, as the crab's back, see? Just in, a, in here. It's fossilised. Look. Yeah, that's got two claws. It's complete. The Nassau is navigatable upriver for 30 kilometres. It's a journey into a timeless land, unspoiled by human interference. Crocodiles bask on every mud bank. They show little fear. Almost to the point of inquisitiveness as beaver cruises close by. Ben anchored beaver in a tidal lagoon festooned with lilies. It was to be their base for the next month. In November, the Gulf is extremely dry and very hot. It's the peak of the dry season, and not one drop of rain has fallen in the two months Ben has been exploring the Gulf. The plains of cracked mud will soon be submerged under a meter of water, but now they are swept by dust storms and willy-willies. Wild pigs and brolgers do not seem to mind the harsh land, but they too must have water. They lead Rick and Lynn to the last remaining freshwater lagoon, which is absolutely choked with a vast variety of wild fowl. Rick disturbs a sleeping wild pig. It charges, but luckily chooses to run for open ground instead. Rick takes the initiative with a second one. The sow has abandoned her litter of tiny piglets. Catch us if you can. Piggy. <laughs> and Mr. Porky. Mr. Porky. 
Okay, off you go. Go on, big, big. You want to go back and find your mum? I think she's in the wallow. I think there's a mother over the there. The Gulf is a land of vivid contrasts, of great rivers and swamps, and spectacular wildlife. A dramatic change takes place in the next month. That's coming up next on The Untamed Gulf. The team saw very few snakes in the Gulf, but Lynn meets a brown tree snake at eye level. In the last of the dry, the inland waterholes have receded into a few clear pools. The marine inhabitants are forced to group in the confined area. Freshwater crocodiles rub shoulders with their prey. Underwater, dramatic shapes emerge out of the eerie stillness. A snake-necked tortoise is on the run. They can hibernate underground if the pool dries up. Ben is eager to film the freshwater croc. They're not aggressive like their saltwater cousins, but it's easy for creatures to lurk behind the curtain of marine growth. Now it's the middle of December, the first storm clouds herald the approaching wet, and the light rain is welcomed by the parched earth. The change is dramatic. The gulf creatures are now consumed by the mating urge, from insects, to sea turtles, to dugong. Upon the first rain, instinct draws the female crocodile out of the water. She will build a nest on the riverbank and bury her eggs deep inside, guarding them with all her ferocity. The monsoonal trough has moved south down the peninsula. The wet has begun. For the next three months, the Gulf inhabitants will shelter from cyclonic storms and torrential flood rains. The upper Nassau River is now an inland lake. The wildlife is dispersed, for there's no shortage of water now. It's miserably wet at the Kendall River, but their flimsy shelters survived this time. The end of the wet heralds a burst of new life. The crocodile eggs have incubated for three wet months, but the floods have damaged the nest and a predator moves in. The goanna and the wild pig will always rob the nest and the hatchlings are often eaten by birds, fish and other crocodiles. The progeny of the pelicans are growing fast. Thousands of insatiable appetites force the parents to fish all day long. The young thrust both beak and head into the mother's pouch, forcing her to regurgitate the catch. It is fortunate that the untamed gulf is a place of plenty.
Two seasons have always marked the only changes in the Gulf. For the creatures of the Gulf, their struggle for survival moves inexorably from the wet season to the dry. Now there's a third change, the most irreversible in nature, as industry encroaches into this vast wilderness area. The pelicans, the dugong, the mud crabs, and the aboriginals have carved their own niche against incredible odds in this untamed wilderness, always a status quo existed. I think we realize now the Gulf is no longer just an unwanted wasteland, but will we have the wisdom to leave it as it is? I've been to cities that never close down From New York to Rio An old London town But no matter how far Or how wide I roam I still call Australia 